Peter Bergen, Vice President at New America. Uh, really thrilled that we have Colonel Frank Sobchak uh, to discuss his new book, Training for Victory, U.S. Special Forces Advisory Operations from El Salvador to Afghanistan. Frank has had a very distinguished career in the uh, U.S. Army, uh, mostly in Special Forces. He's uh, the chair of Irregular Warfare Studies at uh, West Point. He's taught at Tufts um, and uh, Joint Special Operations University. He's PhD is in international relations from the Fletcher School at Tufts. Uh, very importantly, he wrote uh, what will probably remain the only official account of the Iraq war, because for very obvious reasons, there's been no official history. Um, in Britain, there was the Shilcock Inquiry, which was the official history of the British uh, involvement in Iraq. It, I think it generated a two million word report. <laughs> So Frank was with to get together with Joel Rayburn, led a team of eight historians, um, army historians who uh, wrote uh, the U.S. Army in, in the Iraq War, which is a massive piece of um, scholarship and investigation, uh, I, I believe is about um, many, many hundreds of pages was of, and you declassify something like 30,000 pages of documents, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and interestingly, you concluded that the only winner of the Iraq war was Iran, which is a pretty sobering conclusion for a group of very sober army historians. So that's all by way of introduction. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Sobchak. He is, um, going to talk about some of the big themes and stories in, in his book, um, and then I will engage him in Q&A. You have, if you want to submit a question to Colonel Sobchak, um, there is a Slido uh, box on your screen. I will be monitoring those questions as they come in and I'll feed them to the Colonel uh, as we, uh, towards the end of this discussion. Also, if you want to buy the book, there's an ability to do that on screen. So I'll turn it over to Colonel Sobchak. Peter, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. I definitely appreciate the opportunity. So I got the idea for this book kind of from a mystery, from a riddle. And that was the United States spent $35 billion building the Iraqi security forces. We spent $65 billion building the Afghan security forces, only to watch both of them almost effectively collapse overnight. The, the effort to build partner militaries in both countries really can be described as nothing other than a colossal military disaster. <laughs> Except, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's the train wreck. I mean, you know, when, when I talk about it and ask people's opinions about it in a class, you know, I get dumpster fire, disaster, train wreck. It's unmitigated disaster. Yeah. Except for a couple units that are highly effective. In Iraq, the Iraqi Special Operations Forces are engaged in every element of the fight against Daesh, against the Islamic State. They fight a classic retrograde operation from Mosul toward Baghdad. Again, the retrograde is the most difficult military operation to conduct, and they are conducting it effectively, holding and preventing Daesh from getting to Baghdad. They, ca they conduct a air mobile infiltration and seize the critical oil refinery and crossroads at Beji. They hold there and then are surrounded for more than two weeks by Daesh. And they keep fighting. It gets to the point where the Islamic State is tired. They offer them the opportunity to withdraw, well, to let them go peacefully and survive. The ISAF refuses and keeps fighting. They're involved in every element of the phase taking back Mosul, every battle against the Islamic State. They fight. In parallel, in Afghanistan, we see the Afghan commandos in the last few years of the war, they're conducting 80% of the combat operations. And at the, in the final days of 2021, literally as their country is disintegrating around them, they're the ones holding the line, holding the perimeter at Hamid Karzai International Airport literally while their country is no longer going to be exist existing. Kind of brought me to that riddle, brought me to my research question. What was it that made the, these units effective while the rest of the effort was a disaster? 
Specifically, what was it that the special forces advisors in both of these cases was the Green Berets, U.S. Army Special Forces, what factors was it that they did that enabled them to produce combat effective partners? So when I did my study, I not only looked at the ISAF in Iraq and the Afghan commandos, but I also looked at the Light Reaction Regiment in the Philippines, which was a counterterrorism force and a also had the capability to be able to do hostage rescue that was built right around the 2001 to 2003 time period. They were extensively involved in battles against Abu Sayyaf and other elements of uh, Islamic militants in the Philippines. I looked at uh, several Colombian uh, commando units that were built during Plan Colombia. And then I looked at the Biris, the battalions in Infantería de Reacción Inmediatamente in El Salvador, shock forces that were uh, built to to fight the FMLN uh, communist guerrillas in El Salvador during the last phases of the Cold War. To, you know, I, it's impossible to look at all the possible variables that could have made them as these five units as capable, effective partner forces. And so instead, I chose to look at five variables. One of them I looked at was consistency in, consistency in advisor pairing. How often did the same advisors return to work with the same host nation units? I looked at the ratio of partner forces to advisors. In many ways, this is kind of a, a parallel to the, the huge debate over class size. I mean, in many ways, you know, advising is teaching. Um, and so I wanted to look at the U.S. doctrine talks about a ratio of a special forces team or ODA of 12 people advising a battalion of host nation forces. And that was the same ratio that we used with the other uh, forces within Iraq and Afghanistan with our transition teams and other advisory forces. In addition, I looked at factors such as combat advising. Were the host nation forces, did they allow the U.S. advisors to be able to accompany them in combat. Kind of U.S. conventional wisdom has it that this is the gold standard, that you really can't build effective partners without advising them in combat, without fighting shoulder to shoulder with them. And then I also looked at two other factors. I looked at language training and cultural awareness. Does it matter if the advisors can or cannot speak the host nation language? And in fact, interestingly enough, in both the cases of the ISOF and the Afghan commandos, fewer than 20% of the advisors could speak the host nation language. Obviously, Iraq, uh, in Iraq, Arabic, in Afghanistan, Dari, Pashto, or other languages. And then many of the advisors did not speak it effectively. In other words, that they didn't have strong language skills. And then finally, I looked at were the host nation forces willing to allow the advisors to make important changes? Were the advisors able to organize the host nation forces? Were they able to help select leaders? Were they able to change doctrine or recommend changes on combat operations? Those were the factors that, that I looked at. And in terms of findings, Kind of the the key findings that uh, I came up with was one was consistency in advisor pairing is probably one of the most important factors in that, as one advisor told me, you can't surge trust. The interpersonal relationships that are built across multiple rotations really pay dividends in that they allowed the advisors to be able to have difficult conversations with host nation forces. The relationships you know, that were built were so important in that, for example, one advisor who had deployed on eight rotations working with the ISOF, and granted the advisory rotations with the ISOF were shorter, they were only four month rotations, but again, this is 32 months individual has been in Iraq working with the same host nation unit for 32 months. So he knew them in and out and had really 
tight relationships with the individuals of the leaders. In many cases, individuals within the ISOF who had been junior leaders, like lieutenants or captains, at the beginning of the mission, by the end of the mission, eight rotations later, there were two-star generals commanding the entire force. And these advisors had personal relationships that they had built across that span of time so that they could call on them to ask difficult things, especially, for example, in shame and honor societies, uh, to be able to ask questions or request uh, difficult changes, such as, you know, we understand that there's corruption going on and that there are problems with fuel supplies and that some of the fuel supplies are being stolen, this really needs to be tamped down. And it was those personal relationships that allowed them to have those difficult conversations and to be able to make changes. Or, for example, Lieutenant Abbas is working with Kataab Hezbollah. We have intelligence that indicates that, and we think he should be replaced by someone else who is not sectarian and doing extrajudicial killing in his free time. So, <laughs> so let's, you know, work and select and put someone else in uh, instead. The re personal relationships allow them to have those conversations and to be able to make changes. Additionally, the connection over time allowed them to understand the unit, to know what was going on, and to have kind of the experience to be able to see and understand what was happening behind the scenes. As several advisors put it, if you were on multiple rotations, you knew where the bodies were buried, you, it was harder to have someone pull the wool over your eyes and try to conceal things because you had had, you experienced it previously. In addition, it prevented kind of the Groundhog Day type scenario from happening, where if advisors did not return time and time after again, each time a new advisory force would show up, they would simply hit the reset button and restart training with the same training program that had been in place previously. And in multiple cases, you know, I was fortunate. I did, I interviewed 110 individuals, did about 200 hours of interviews total. I interviewed non-commissioned officers, sergeants, officers, generals, State Department personnel, civilians, uh, U.S. military in the embassy, Green Berets, as well as many host nation forces. And it, I found it very interesting because in multiple cases, both in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Colombia, the host nation forces were some of those who were most apoplectic about the problem of having new advisors come in every time. And they were, you know, told me in these interviews that they'd say, look, the Americans would come in a new set and they would start teaching the same things that we had already learned before. And it was pointless. And we tried to explain it to them that it was useless, but they wouldn't listen because they had their fixed doctrine and a fixed lesson plan that they had to teach. <laughs> so, so kind of across the board, consistency and bias repairing was absolutely essential kind of for, for all of those reasons. It was the most important factor to be able to have an impact on producing combat effective partners. And frankly, it was something that was not done with the rest of the Iraqi and Afghan militaries and the unmitigated military disasters. The forces that were successful were ones that had the same advisors return time and time again. Hmm. One interesting vignette uh, comes from Iraq. If we have time, I have others. So in Iraq in 2014, as Daesh, as the Islamic State, has captured Mosul, starting to head south, one of those former advisors, who again had spent eight, ten rotations in Iraq, was still in Iraq working as a contractor. And it was providing security for State Department personnel at outstations. Of course, the, the State Department leadership in Iraq recognizes the levity of the situation and the danger, goes to the contractor and says, hey, you know, we need troops now to help protect us, to protect Americans, because Daesh could be here in a matter of days. And so he said, sure, no problem, picked up his phone, 
called a two-star general who was the second in command of the ISOF and asked for a meeting. They then got together, drove to the general's house. The general came up and again, this individual was a former NCO. He was a sergeant major. The general gave him a huge bear hug, welcomed him, turned to the State Department leader and said, this man is my brother. We have killed many men together and drank many beers. Whatever you need, I will give you. And then he provided Iraqi security forces that he did not have to provide to secure Americans just based on that personal relationship. No monetary exchange, no nothing, just the relationship. So in addition to consistency and advisor pairing, another conclusion was that, and this is a complicated one and it's also a difficult one for me because I went to Georgetown Masters in Arts and Arab Studies program as part of the School of Foreign Service. I speak, read, write Arabic. I was paid as an Arabic linguist by the army. I also speak Spanish quite effectively, grew up in South Florida, had Spanish from second grade on every day. But my finding was that language and cultural awareness was more of an enhancing factor than an essential factor. And that it wasn't absolutely necessary to be able to speak the host nation language to be able to produce a combat effective partner force. And this is also interesting and it's difficult because this, this goes against the grain of Lawrence's 15 principles. It goes against kind of U.S. doctrine and kind of conventional wisdom. We spent within special forces, the budget is on language training is around $51 million a year. But in both the case of the ISOF and the Afghan commandos, very few advisors actually spoke the host nation language to any skill greater than really to be able to ask where the bathroom was. What we just kind of discovered had happened was that over time, both the host nation forces started picking up English, there were interpreters who, frankly, were able to converse much better than any advisor could be able to learn Arabic or Pashto in such a short time. And so it was the, the interpreters that became absolutely critical. In addition, kind of the, the nuances of, of the argument is that you know, it's not necessary to know the language of the host nation, but it's important to know a language. And that that is still important. So that rather than kind of getting wrapped around the axle and really worried about making sure you match the, the host nation language where you're deployed, because that's, it's a gamble. It's a roulette game at best. What's important is that you know a language because knowing a language gives you empathy. It gives you cross-cultural communication. It gives you patience. It gives you many skills and characteristics that are important as an advisor. And in many cases, it was just that, that those characteristics, it was more important to have characteristics of being a good advisor than to know the language. And there are multiple kind of cases where even host nation forces told me of situations where individuals spoke broken Spanish with very thick West Virginia or Southern accents who were better advisors because they were patient, they were empathetic, they were mature, they were capable of operating in locations by themselves with little guidance or little support that they were flexible as compared to individuals who were drill sergeants, who were native Spanish speakers, who were deployed, who were sent home after two weeks because their personalities just didn't match their job as advisors. And that the host nation forces refused to listen to them or refused to do anything because they grated on them so strongly that it just didn't work out. As we all know, some people are just not meant to be cut out to be teachers or advisors. And this was kind of the, the lesson that uh, developed from, from that specific po portion of the study. One, and we could go into a lot of detail into language if you wanted to in the questions, because there's a lot of, there are many asterisks. 
there's kind of an exception in Spanish where it didn't match the findings for all the other case studies. We could talk about that later if you wanted to. Um, but kind of the last uh, conclusion out, out of many, I mean, there are many, if you, could, you could discuss whatever you wanted to. One of the other ones that I thought was worthwhile noting was that contrary again to U.S. conventional wisdom and to U.S. doctrine, you do not have to con combat advise your partners to be able to produce an effective military force. In fact, the most effective partner, the Colombian SAW forces, were advised in a scenario where the U.S. was not allowed to accompany them in combat, and in many cases kind of did the Princess Bride, you know, equivalent of, have fun storming the castle, as they marched off to, to, to fight. Those were the most effective forces that, that were built. And Colombia, at a kind of strategic level, went from exporting coca and being a country where portions of its territory were determined to be a failing state, likely to fall to the FARC. It went from that to being an exporter of security force assistance, where its special operations forces are doing security force assistance in foreign internal defense, advising foreign militaries throughout the, US, the Southern Command Area responsibility in order to be more effective combat forces. And again, that was all without advising them in combat. And so I'll kind of wrap up there. Those were the, the lessons I, I, I learned from this study. It was a, a tremendous opportunity. And I was very thankful of so many individuals that gave so much of their time and resources and shared with me both their lessons as well as unclassified documents and information. Well, uh, Frank, this is, this is fascinating. Um, so that... It's very counterintuitive, the idea that the forces that you didn't go into combat with turn out <laughs> really <laughs> to work out really well. It makes complete sense that consistency and returning and familiarity and time with uh, as an advisor makes you much more effective. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, this is a side note. This is an interesting, you know, Eric Prince was advocating, as you may recall, mm -hmm. Um, a, an idea that got quite a lot of uh, headroom initially at the Trump administration in the first six months, sending retired special forces on contracts to particular areas that they knew and that they would re con you know, repeatedly return to those areas. The idea on its face um, was not a bad one. The problem was there were going to be contractors. <laughs> and yes. there, was no, there was no universe from a legal, ethical financial, whatever, that DOD was going to sort of say, you know, we're going to subcontract the war out to a group of contractors, some of whom weren't even going to be American citizens. But I mean, but, but Prince was right that it makes sense for people to go back to the same. I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's human nature. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to send somebody to go where they have, you know, again and again to different places around Afghanistan rather than sending them back to the same place. So that that conclusion is is not surprising. You you um, you also talked to one of the variables about the host nation's ability to allow advisors to make you know real ch sort of substantive changes. So because uh, I can imagine some countries having like very tight rules about what advisors can and can't do, or, or they or they're just advising and they can't really make decisions. So what what did you find on that? So on that, I found that there was almost like a honeymoon period war what i kind of turned as a termed as a sovereignty clock in mm -hmm. that more often than not the host nation forces were willing to accept changes early on in the mission mm -hmm. and it was very interesting because it was both in the cases of iraq and afghanistan where there's regime change and the u.s kind of has carte blanche to do and form a military in theoretically almost whatever manner it wanted to but it was also in scenarios as in the Light Reaction Regiment in the Philippines, in Colombia, and El Salvador. And hypothesizing, because no one could quite really put the finger on what why this was, it, it was almost as if that, in many cases, the mission 
in, in all five of these case studies, that advisory effort was a national strategic priority. And the U.S. was bringing lots of cash, lots of effort. It was, they were big. In each one of them, it was going to be a long-term effort and it was going to be a sustained presence and it was a, something that was a priority. And so hypothesizing, it was simply that they recognized that, wow, you know, Christmas or Hanukkah comes in July and that the Americans are now showing up with lots of gear, lots of money, lots of trainers, and it enabled them to kind of put some of their sovereignty concerns aside and accept change. In the case, for example, of the ISOF, one of the future senior commanders of, of the unit, uh, General Fadel Barawi, who was a Kurd, actually worked with the Americans in, 90, in the late 90s during Provide Comfort. He'd been a security guard as the U.S. was, you know, protecting, had the no-fly zones, and then as well as on-the-ground efforts to, to help protect the Kurds. He later was selected early on as one of the first company commanders for he was the second company commander for the 36th commando battalion which later became a brigade and then a division he went from a, a security guard to a captain company commander to a two-star general and that was because he was selected in that very early period where the iraqis simply were like we're, we're not going to intercede for whatever reason it was interesting also because in some cases it was almost like a resurgence of a relationship in the Philippines, you know, post uh, Cold War, Subic Bay and Clark Airfield had been shut down. This was an opportunity where the Americans were kind of coming back in strength to help and with open purse strings. Another kind of factor that affected that over time was at the beginning of the mission, it was new. And there hadn't been any chances or opportunities for, frankly, things to go wrong, whether they be an American to get killed accidentally or as happened in one case where the one of the units that the U.S. was training uh, attempted a coup unsuccessfully. <laughs> uh, the Oakwood plot, it was really very much a fizzled coup is kind of where people were just talking about it and they took over a, a theater directly and make a political point. The unit was then purged of leaders, new ones were put in, but interestingly enough, there were enough subordinate leaders who had refused to go along with the coup, who are still left in the unit, that the cultural identity that the United States helped put in remained over time. And that the unit, while it had a drop kind of in respect, interest from the Philippine government, over time, it slingshotted back up, particularly during the Battle of Marawi and, and other operations against Islamic militants, where the, the unit went from being a scourge to, again, not quite the savior of the nation, but highly respected where the president is coming down and visiting and taking a photo ops with its members because of its successes. Let me ask you a little bit, a bit about more about Iraq. I mean, as you know, the Biden administration is negotiating uh, a withdrawal. It's a little unclear what this, the 2,500 American troops are. They're there on an advise and assist anti-ISIS mission. Uh, obviously, the Trump administration will inherit this withdrawal. I, don't, I think it's politically convenient for the Iraqis to say the Americans are withdrawing because so many of them are sort of sent, uh, Iran aligned, let's say. And I think sure. it's pretty convenient for the United States to say we're withdrawing. But my guess is that the, we're not going to rerun the videotape of leaving completely in December 2011 because much of war is psychological. And if, I think if the United States goes to zero, there are enough Iraqis around who remember, remember remembered what happened in 2014 for that to be seen as really... Because if there are no American troops, it's just then there's no American interest in your country. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being exactly. very reductive, but I mean... The fact that there is an American presence there, I think, is is good for the good for Iraqis, and it's, these are not people on the front lines. There, and so we'll see how that 
plays out. But I, you know, I I feel like the the story of the American support for the Iraqi counterterrorism service, in particular, its Golden Division, mm -hmm. and I, I met I know General Al Saidi, who was uh, he was kind of the Rommel of uh, or maybe maybe it's the wrong general, but he <laughs> he was extremely popular in Iraq, right? I mean, he could have he was so popular that they I think they sidelined him because he was seen as incorrupt and very successful and all the things you want. Exactly. Values uh, that we instilled. What's that? Values that I think we helped instill. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, he he's a, a very interesting... I mean, I met him in Baghdad and I know his family uh, and a uh, very impressive human being. But so, yeah, it's... All, a, I think it's an undertold story because uh, it, it was a success. I mean, I, I uh, here's a question for you. Do you know how many American soldiers died in Iraq during the anti-ISIS mission? I mean, I, I'm thinking it's a handful, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I don't know precisely if, I mean, I, I would speculate it's 100, 200 total Okay. at most, if, Okay. if that. Yeah. And Very I'll give small. interesting number too, because you know when we when we think about the lessons of the post nine eleven wars, I mean, you're this to me is a pretty big lesson, which is if we had, you know, I'm shorthanding it and sort of using Pentagonese, if we'd gone light and gone long in almost all of these conflicts, which is one one of the sort of debates that happened with the. The Council of Colonels, I think, in 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 Iraq was like, what what should we do? Yeah, it, I think it has so many advantages. A, it doesn't cost much financially or polit politically at home. B, it often is pretty successful. <laughs> C, it's very sustainable, and then D, it's also sustainable with the host country because it's like you're not you don't have like fifty thousand Americans on a base somewhere and. You know, it doesn't look like an occupation. it doesn't look like an occupation. So it's like we took a long, we, the United States, took a long time to come around to something in a way that was pretty obvious. And, you know, even if you go back to the debates in the, in the Obama administration in 2009, then Vice President Joe Biden was advocating a version of this, which was he called it counterterrorism plus. So that was the sort of shorthand, which is. And I, you know, I thought at the time thought he was wrong. Uh, or I think a lot of people thought he was wrong. But I think looking back on it, I think he was right. And I think he obviously he had the scar tissue from those debates, which he lost, I think, informed his terrible decision to go to zero in Afghanistan. Because I, I, I think that if we had kept one Marine outside the U.S. Embassy, Afghans were not focused on the absolute they could care less if it was 2500 american troops or 8400 or what you know that obviously there's a difference from a military point of view but it was really the psychological issue that was the most important thing because when we just said we're leaving well every nato country left and every nato embassy closed and all the contractors left, and it was it was a cascade cascading set of errors so as we look at this you know the, the go like go, go long which is basically what your book is in a sense about um tends to be pretty effective and i i, I mean are there examples where it just failed as far as the going light and going long yeah meaning like so an it's advise and assist missions u.s special forces i mean i, I mean you you, you so look at el salvador and i don't know the history of that salvador it's a very small american force right at that time Fifty five uh advisors, a cap. yeah but There's what a little bit of fudging played with it, but yeah yeah I think Mike Sheehan was one of the one of the one of those advisors. I I know believe you're right. he was. He was. Yeah. Who? Uh, um, but what, so, what do you? You know, because I, I I'm very convinced that this go like go long is the right approach. Uh, and but one size cannot possibly fit all situations. So you know, I think the challenge of Iraq is that there were, Iraq went through many different phases of the war, Yeah. and in particular, I I would. posit that during the civil war that the go light go long might not have worked in Okay. that there would have needed to be something to kind of tamp down the civil war to prevent things from really spinning out of control Right. and and that we horrifically managed that and we Right. be more accurately mismanaged it very fundamentally Right. i, I would on the kind of a general topic, I think to me, I, I concur 
the go light, go long is really important. In Iraq and Afghanistan, bizarrely, early on in the mission, there's kind of this constant assumption that our advi our mission in Iraq, that we're going to be withdrawing, or Afghanistan, that we're going to be withdrawing in three or four years, or or two years even. And that's kind yeah. of keeps rolling, right? As 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 we're not able to do that now, but we'll just shift it more to the right. And it just keeps happening. And and that assumption affected that assumption that it wasn't going to be a long-term mission affected how we did business. And but can I can I ask you something about Frank? Sure, it, yeah, this sorry. strikes me as a very important point because the United States was born in its as in a, in a revolution. And and it sees us you know, essentially it's an anti-imperial project, mm -hmm. and it always in its own mind you know we're different from the French and we're different from the English, and that comes, a lot of things flows from that which is like we're not going to really learn, we're not going to learn the languages, we're not going to have the car you know I mean there are obviously exceptions to people like you but you know uh, and we're also not going to stay because this is like this very American thing like so we're going to sort this out in the next six months or nine months or during my tour we'll have or colonies whatever. <laughs> but we're not going to have colonies. So I think that that part of that is sort of like the United States just in its DNA finds it very hard to, and now obviously there are exceptions. I mean, the Philippines, you know, after the end of the Spanish-American War, sure. you know, we were there for a long time. But but these are sort of more exceptions that prove the rule. So I, I'm just, I'm wondering if part of the nature of the American psyche, because when, you, when, when I say go like go long, I also mean there's a messaging part of this, which is saying we are planning to stay. <laughs> we, are, we are not leaving because that, I, I remember being with the Marines in, in Helmand in 2009. And there was a lieutenant colonel from Minnesota who was asked by a farmer, an elder, you know, how long are you staying? And I, he answered, I think, in a very interesting way, which is he told the truth. <laughs> he said, I can only say that I will be here for the next nine months or that my unit will only be, you know, and, and I think the elder's response was like, you know, basically you're going to be here for nine months and the Taliban is going to be here forever. So thanks for that, you know, very important piece of information. So, you know, it, I, I feel like there is a big messaging component to us, but you obviously can't message something that's false. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I fundamentally agree with that. I think there's a really critical psychological component of it that it's it, if you deliver a message that we're leaving, everyone yeah. starts approaches everything differently. And I mean, you know, it is it is a fine line because you you don't want to be you don't want to trigger it so far as that you start triggering kind of you know antibodies of anti-colonial antibodies. Yeah. But at the, at the same point, you don't want to trigger the other conclusions that, like you said in the with the case with the Minnesota National Guard officer, that they're leaving. I'm on my own. I'm not going to yeah. tell them anything. I'm not going to help them because that affects me in the future. Another, I, another variable here must be like you looked at Colombia. Now, I, I was in Colombia in the mid 90s. The, the place, I mean, Pablo Escobar was tearing apart the Colombian state, as you know. I mean, completely. literally. But, and, you know, he was kidnapped. He was assaulting the Supreme Court. He was kidnapping all the, uh, the children of the elite. The place was on fire. A disaster. Uh, <laughs> and there, there, were, there were more kidnappings in Colombia from 1998 to 2001 than in Afghanistan. I believe That's it. how bad it was. It was, <laughs> it was horrible. It was, it was really bad. So, so when a country is facing something like this, and the United States says comes in and says, "Hey, we can help you," I mean, what they they were obviously very receptive. I mean, how many? What were the number of U.S. special forces there, roughly, in the advise and assist? So that was again a similar light footprint. You yeah, probably had a battalion, approximately sized. You did sometimes have a, a larger kind of headquarters. Um, that managed things, but you know, no more than a couple hundred advisors at most. Right. And then, of course, and, there was there was there was a lot of American money. Plan Colombia came with billions of dollars of aid, right? Yes, we were also fortunate in that early on, we kind of made it a requirement the the Samper administration in Colombia 
the, the U.S. basically said, hey, look, you're too corrupt. We're not going to, to finance you until you kind of clean house. And the Colombians, really to their credit, they took it to heart. And they did a lot of clean house. They fired a bunch of four-star generals. New administration comes in. And, and, and you know, like we talked about, like the cascading effects of that, right? It's this virtuous cycle where when four four stars, new four stars who are perceived and who are um, anti-corrupt, who are effective, who are capable leaders, who are warriors come in. It's not just them. It's all of their subordinates that they bring with them. And that's what kind of creates that sea change where you really start seeing that big aircraft carrier changing its direction. Another factor here that you didn't mention, but I'm sure you mentioned in your book, is I mean the advise and assist mission against ISIS in Iraq was also there was a tremendous amount of American air power involved. Yeah, huge. Um, and uh, you know, there's a uh, it, obviously Mosul was you know more or less demolished in the process um, it went to extirpate uh, ISIS, but. Um, so the integration of American, effective integration of American air power, uh, clearly not in every case, not in Colombia, but in in Iraq, was is part of this. I think that's a huge component of it, and I mean that's what advisors bring in many cases. Advisors right. bring that right. capability. Interestingly enough, the ISOF had actually been trained well enough that there were elements of it who were who were JTACs, who were Joint Terminal Advisor Controllers, who were individuals who knew how to call in close air support. But it was only the US rules that said, ah, well, we're not comfortable with having Iraqis drop American bombs. So in some cases, what was happening is the Iraqi JTACs were just talking to an American Special Forces advisor, telling him, and then he just relayed it. It was just, you know, the the two tin cans with the, the wire on it were, were wiring the, the same information to kind of expedite things. Um, but unquestionably also there were um, close air support, joint terminal air controllers who were guiding bombs, dropping bombs. That becomes a huge portion of it. But in some ways that's that's the beauty of the, the low footprint system where you bring the things where the United States is really good at and you know, the American way of war since really almost the Civil War has been send a bullet, not a man. You mm. use artillery, you use airstrikes, you don't send people in to try to, you know, clear a building because that's going to produce a lot of casualties. You know, obviously the, the Russian version is the flip of this, send the man, <laughs> not the bullet. Um, but historically, that's been our way of war. And so when you have advisors who can bring that, the strength of the American Air Force, you know, the at this point in world history, the, you know, the, the greatest air force in the world to bear that, you know, you're you're applying strength to weakness. And so you mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, you know, you were interested in this puzzle, 65 billion dollars for the Afghan army and 35 billion for the Iraqi army and the Iraqi army basically collapsed and fled. Admittedly, the yeah. United States had already left the country at that time when ISIS had started attacking. Uh, and the Afghan army, obviously, you know, President Biden said the Afghans didn't fight for their own country. I think that was quite unfair in the sense that 66,000 Afghan soldiers and police died fighting. Died. Very unfair. But, but, I, Very but unfair. I, I, I think it's more of a you know, the Afghans have been through uh, you know almost half a century of warfare at this point, and everybody wants to keep their head on their shoulders. And there's a you know they if they it, see the, the the cause is lost, they're going to surrender. They're not going to. It's not they're yeah. not going to fight to the death. I mean it it because you know they've seen they've seen the Taliban come and go. They've seen the Americans come and go. They've seen the Russians come and go. It, it's it's uh, it's kind of um, Afghans tend not to want to fight in a fight that will lead to everybody getting killed it's much more performative is the wrong word but it's much more guerrilla light guerrilla warfare where you know you're not going to have massive casualties it's kind of their preferred form of fighting i think for sure they have a much longer view of history and of operations than the united states and you know it's like you said when we say that we are leaving why should they put stick their neck out for yep. 
for it because the chances of survival past that are are low. You know, it, it is, it's really unfortunate and it's frustrating in some ways. I mean, there are Afghan commando units, you know, in 2020, 2019, that are literally fighting to the last round. They run out of ammunition. They get captured. They're, they're begging for ammunition on social media, <laughs> sending it broadly out, sending it out to their former advisors, former Green Beret advisors, texting them to try to see if they can somehow in a bizarre, almost grenade like moment to get them to call down to somebody else to bring in ammunition. Well, well so when you analyze the fate, because I, I, I think the failure of the Iraqi army, I, I sort of feel I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on not only the corruption of the sectarianism, sure. also yes. the United States had left. So when ISIS yeah. came, they, they just threw down their weapons. But with the Afghans, you know, the Americans were there. Um, there isn't the sectarian element, although there is the ethnic element. There, there's an so, ethnic element. Yeah, and then there's a corruption element. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, a classic uh, kind of uh, analysis says we try to build the force in, in Afghanistan in our own image. Is that really true? Is that not true? And what was I mean? You're you're talking about the successes, but let the, the failures that prompted you to write this book. What did we get wrong in Afghanistan? We got so much wrong in Afghanistan. So on one end, you know, one of the conclusions of my book is that you need capable advisors. And and frankly, after you know, both Iraq and Afghanistan, those kind of twin disasters, there were a number of sometimes scholarly, sometimes sensational reports where the U.S. can't build partner militaries. And the problem is, is that in terms of our effort with the larger missions, we almost really didn't try. And mm -hmm. the problem is, is that we didn't really get serious about having advisors, like professional advisors, in my mind, until almost the 2016 timeframe. Mm -hmm. We are early on, the way that we are picking advisors is leaders are looking through the records and going, oh, this individual hasn't deployed to combat. It's their turn. And then rather than like selecting and assessing them to find out, is this person actually like capable of being advisor? Does he or she have the personality traits and the characteristics to be a good advisor? Nope. It's you go to the simple shake and bake three to four weeks of training and voila, magically, you are an advisor, of which most of that training that they're actually doing isn't related to advising. It's related to their survival, because instead of picking actual units where people have worked together, we're picking from across the force 12 individuals, putting them together like a pickup team and saying, guess what? Now you're playing the Super Bowl and I hope you live. Good luck. Trying to advise like that is madness. It's completely insane. And yet that's what we did as kind of our main effort. Wasn't, wasn't, there a, wasn't there a kind of um, a counterinsurgency advisory group that Petraeus stood up in like 2010? You had some pretty capable officers like uh, Roger Carstens and Fernando Lujan and others who... Mm -hmm. Uh, and the and the you know who who you know in some cases were Afghan hands, so they learned the languages yeah. and blah blah blah. So that that does suggest an understanding earlier that this was needed. Yes, it was, and we certainly made efforts to do it. Like the Afpak hands, the Afghan Pakistan hands, yeah. was it was an initiative that was in the right direction. We had other initiatives where, you know, around the 2015 time, we started to skin stand up security force assistance brigades, which are good. The training increases to six weeks. There's still really not really much assessment and selection to determine whether someone is, is, is a capable advisor, but there's a little bit, there's like a day or two, maybe the problem is, is that individuals don't have an advisor MOS or advisor job title. So there's nothing that keeps them returning to that same job. And in huh. fact, because it's like an additional skill, anytime that in, in the career pattern that they spend outside of their main job can actually be detrimental to their career. And this is something we kind of saw across the, the board systemically within the U.S. military, that for much of the time, being an advisor was seen as a negative 
for someone's career. And they're human resources managers who are literally telling people, don't be an advisor, it'll damage your career. Which is sort of crazy. <laughs> and that was our main effort. That was how we thought that we were going to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm. It, it, unless you have a closed circuit where the advisors are professional advisors who are returning to the same American units or who are staying who have as a job, their primary job description, that they're advisors, and then they return to the same host nation units. We, but, we were doing it on both sides. We weren't even returning it, our advisors to our own units. It isn't sort of special forces, Green Berets. I mean, it, isn't that sort of the, the mission? So, For sure. So it, it, it is. So there are challenges in that. So the two challenges, one was frankly, okay, I love my regiment. I'm incredibly proud of being former special forces officer it it was the best job i ever had but we are a little schizophrenic and that is because when we go back to our lineage and you know our identity you talk about the american identity right well there's the special forces identity the problem is is we have two dads okay and we don't know who which dad is the right dad we have one <laughs> dad is this first, first special service force, which is the joint Canadian US commando force that kills people, breaks things, does direct action and raids during World War II. Our other dad is the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the Central Intelligence Agency and Special Operations Command. In fact, the patch for the OSS was going to be, or is now the patch for US Special Operations Command who did during World War II behind the lines advisory efforts with the Maquis, with the resistance in France, with the resistance in Yugoslavia, with the resistance in China, uh, missions where they're doing security force assistance. And it's a requirement to speak a language where you're parachuting behind lines to work and advise. The fact that we don't know who really, where our identity comes from creates mm kind of a bipolar almost identity where elements of the organization drift toward the first special service force, kill capture, direct action, smash things, identity, commando, and then others drift toward the, you know, advising identity of the OSS. The, the second component of it at a, at a national level is the challenge that when you're building up militaries as large as the Iraqi and Afghan forces, and you have other commitments globally, and especially when you're building the Afghan and Iraqi uh, militaries in concert, like together at the same time, you literally run out of special forces advisors. Right. They're just, they're just aren't enough. So you need other professional advisors within the force structure, but with the, big army, that is the last thing they want to do because they're all focused on large scale combat operations. I mean, in terms of identity, you look at their identity, look at the last two uniforms they have. They're, they're wearing the World War II uniform now, and they're wearing the Civil War uniform before that as their dress uniform. That's the, their identity of large scale combat operations, of maneuvering divisions and corps and brigades. The thought that they would get, you know, frankly, trapped in their mind to do advising is the last thing in the world they want to do. And so they resist it for massively. We're fortunate now that there have been some, I would say, both enlightened and very forward thinking leaders who've recognized that the need exists and who've created the security force assistance brigades. They're definitely a step in the right direction, but there's still, there's a long way to go because again, it's not a closed cycle. The training isn't really enough. Um, but but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Here's a question from an audience member. Although it was not one of your variables, how much did material support dependency affect the long-term competency of the host nation organization, which I guess means, uh, you know, I, 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 by giving too much to the Afghan government, for instance, um, yeah, do we just kind of create this dependent sort of yeah. government and it's army? I mean, it's a, it's a tricky one because you have it to is. get them made, but yeah. So go ahead. It's a great question. And full transparency, one of the reasons why I did not study that was the challenge of trying to find out exactly how much was given to the ISOF, the commandos, and all the other units. Finding those that number and to be able to track it without 
having extensive declassification efforts would be challenging. The other reason I didn't do it is because within kind of the scholarship of security force assistance right now, there, there have been a number of studies who've already looked at that, looked at the variable of how much is the right amount? And yeah. in, in core, the conclusion is, is that in many cases, giving too much is completely counterproductive in, in that there's almost a variable where when you give too much, the combat effectiveness actually starts to drop. Mm. And the hypothesis kind of behind it was that when you give too much, it effectively, you, you know, becomes fuel for corruption. It becomes fuel for many other problems, it becomes logistics challenges of trying to maintain all this different sets of equipment. And it just creates more problems than than it does. There is certainly a sweet spot in terms of material assistance, but the conclusions are right now in the academia, in the academia is that too much is bad. This is more of a comment or observation from a AJ Germek. Uh, go heavy has failed. Go light has failed. Maybe we should just stick to sending munitions and intelligence. So I would respectfully disagree with that. I don't think, you know, especially in all five of these cases, we've created effective partners. In many ways, I would argue we really haven't tried effectively. You know, when if you don't focus on having professional, capable advisors, you, you're not even trying. By the way, is, make it, is it analogous, Frank? I mean, because you're a guy who's got a PhD, and you're. I mean, I, I've always heard also that. You know, take you know, getting a graduate degree can you can be penalized in the army. Maybe that's begun to change. For sure, but not but so, much. Okay, <laughs> I would agree. So, still. You know, it's all power. You know, which is all like it's amazing that becoming a, an advisor would be counted against you in your career. The things that actually are helpful, the you know, having you know, stepping outside for two years and doing a graduate degree if you're going to be a a colonel or a one star or you know a flag officer it just uh, it just it just seems odd that these things are still something that are sort of held against you for in promotion it, or don't help you for promotion it, it is but you know there's the old adage that culture eats strategy for breakfast and, mm. and the culture of the US military is fighting large scale combat operations world war 2 civil war we want to fight those simple straightforward Good guys versus bad guys, roundels painted on enemy aircraft, national signs painted on their tanks and flags on people's shoulders. Simple stuff like that. I, could I add one other thing real quick, yeah, though? Yeah. One of the challenges with the advisory efforts in both Iraq and Afghanistan is, frankly, strategic mismanagement on what direction we should be approaching for multiple years. For, for, for the case of Iraq, the one that I'm most familiar with, Obviously, we invade in 2003, we withdraw in 2011, roughly eight years, right? So until 2006, we go through three iterations of what the Iraqi army even should be. We've got the Iraqi Civilian Defense Corps, the Iraqi National Guard, and then the new Iraqi army. And in each case, we're trying to decide, for example, early on, the strategic guidance is, you cannot be a threat to any of your neighbors. Well, that translates to they don't get mortars, they don't get tanks, they don't get rocket-propelled grenades. They're going to get machine guns, AK assault rifles, and pistols. Well, guess what? When you're going up against insurgents, you're at a disadvantage when you've yeah. structured yourself not to be a threat against your neighbors because you can't even be a, a threat against the insurgents within your own country. Very good point. We have time for one more question, which is, this is a good one. What are the main policy implications going forward when the new U.S. presidential administration wants to pull back from international conflict writ large? And I would add that, you know, clearly that was also the Biden approach. Yeah, I, unfortunately, the trend that is kind of a flavor within the American identity of isolationism, you know, the John Birch Society is, has gone from in many ways kind of being a fringe to almost a central flavor in in some well, of but our frankly, maybe an addendum to that which is i mean 
there's actually a tremendous sort of agreement on the left of the Democrat Party and on the right of the Republican Party that we just don't want any of this again. For sure. <laughs> Even though history suggests that we something else is going to come up. So yeah. um, actually, we have a couple more that have come in. Let me just add, kind of combine them and, and then sure. you get your final thoughts. How do you assess the impact of suicide ter terrorism campaigns in shaping the strategic decisions that led to the withdrawal of U.S.-led forces from Afghanistan? And would you classify the Salvador mission as success? At the end of the 1980s, the same guys we trained for years were still executing civilians in cold blood. Uh, so suicide, El Salvador, and then the first one that we were just concluding was, oh, the the back and forth of isolationism. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the challenge is, is, is that's... we. This is why we fail at security force assistance fundamentally is that we create this argument that, oh, we're never going to do this again. So if we're never going to do it again, we shouldn't create force structure. We shouldn't create doctrine. We shouldn't create an effective set of advisors. And then surprise, lo and behold, something happens again and we've got to do a large scale security force assistance mission. And then we fail. Shocker you know, surprise. And then the same people who say, oh, you know, look, I told you we could never do this. It hasn't because, you know, we can't do it. It's because we haven't tried. We haven't really prioritized it as, as, a, as a core element. So suicide bombers, the, how did it affect the, the overall mission? I think it did have an impact. And I think one of the challenges, one of the, at the fundamental personal level, is that as an advisor, you have to be willing to trust the host nation forces, particularly in scenarios like Iraq and Afghanistan, where you're working and often fighting shoulder to shoulder and dying next to them. If you have to start thinking, well, this guy might kill me too, that has an impact. And it's really difficult to psychologically get past that. In Iraq, very early on, we created programs in a culture where there was so much emphasis and testing to make sure that the right individuals became part of the CTS, Counterterrorism Service, or ISOF, that there, to my knowledge and to my research, there are zero green on blue incidents in Iraq. None. Not one. Afghanistan's a different story, but some of that is related to the fact that we started the program a couple years with the commandos later than with than the ISOF started in Iraq. And we weren't able to really input programs or create programs that oversaw and, and really blocked people from coming. There was more accepted everyone. So one, one advisor described it as no kid left behind, no Afghan mm -hmm. left behind. Everyone could be a commando. On the El Salvador, El Salvador is complicated, and unquestionably, the Beeries had human rights violations. Now, at the same point, did we fail in El Salvador? The U.S. chose, the, when the mission was started, the Warner Commission presented to the National Command Authority, Reagan and SecDef, three options, three courses of action. One, total victory, where El Salvador would, would win. Two, um, a victory, but a protracted campaign. And three, stalemate, where we simply prevented the, the government from falling. We actually chose as a nation, the National Command Authority, option three, because of both one, the financial cost, and two, post-Vietnam War, you know, we're, we're not even a decade after the Vietnam, the ability for the U.S. to commit largely to that was not possible. We achieved that objective of preventing the government from falling. And even on the human rights issue, well, again, unquestionably, there were there were problems and that sh shouldn't have occurred. At the same time, guess what? The El Salvadoran military, when the the government decided to sue for peace and disband the Beeries and send a large portion of the military home, basically, hey, you know, here's your pink slip, you're no longer working, you no longer have a job. They accepted that. That's proper civil and military relations. 
even more so when the FMLN was granted to be an actual political party and ran to be part of the government, the military still accepted that. So we made progress. We did not get perfection. There were definitely horrific things that happened. But we, we moved the needle, even on human rights in El Salvador. Great. Well, thank you very much, Colonel Sobchak. The book is Training for Victory. Uh, congratulations on the book, and thank you for this brilliant presentation.